Okay, so next up we have James Robinson. James is uh, pretty much the world authority on intranets because that's all he's ever done. He goes and speaks all around the world. He's written uh, the authoritative books on intranets. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you, James. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, okay, so we have a bit of time to talk about intranets, so a good period of time. So uh, I'm going to walk through a bunch of stuff. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to ask questions wherever you like. Just wave your hand about, we'll get you a microphone, we'll have a good conversation about stuff and that'll keep everyone awake on this cold night. Okay, so I guess the context for this is to say that intranets have been around for a very long time. So in most large organisations, uh, intranets have been in place for I don't know, 10 years, 15 years now. They have evolved from things that were originally created on the side from front, front page with the bouncing ball and the waving palm trees and the blink. We love that stuff. Some of that stuff still exists. But obviously much time has passed and hopefully we're doing better. That being said, that is not people's general experience within organisations. So I think the real, if you talk to any users, any actual normal people, staff within organisations, then generally speaking, they're not ecstatically happy with the intranet they've got. They will typically complain that they can't find staff or the content is out of date or they don't actually need it for anything or that typically search sucks, things like this. So I guess the question is, why does everyone have an intranet? Why have we had intranets for so long? I mean, you guys have probably built a bunch. Let me, let me do an audience poll. How many people have been involved in building some or part or all of an intranet? There we go. Yeah, so a bunch of people, and that's typically because SharePoint. So SharePoint, uh, I guess, is a huge opportunity for intranets, and I'll talk more about that for in a second. But I guess of particular interest and in why I'm here talking about stuff and why I'm talking about intranets is that SharePoint intranets is one of the main things that are developed. Yes, you can use SharePoint for a website. That's obviously stupid. Uh, I could be wrong on that. Uh, but SharePoint is primarily deployed within organisations to help staff do their jobs and thus an awful lot of people have gone off to build intranets. Now why would I say that intranets are, uh, that SharePoint is an opportunity? It's because traditionally intranets have been exceedingly dull. There have been a bunch of pages with a bunch of out of date content and a bunch of documents that no one can really find. So they're static, lifeless entities. Along comes SharePoint, often deployed by IT, and suddenly now we have all this greater functionality. Suddenly now we have out of the box the collaboration features, particularly in later versions of SharePoint, all the social stuff. And we've now got a platform that we can start to develop stuff, where we've got all of the workflow and all of these capabilities. So SharePoint is transforming intranets within organisations. But the challenge remains how do we make sure that we're delivering great intranets rather than more crap intranets just on a different platform? And that's, I guess, what I want to look at in this discussion is what makes a great intranet? Uh, and there's no one answer to that. We're, we're going to explore that a bit. So why am I here? So Adam made reference to this. So I've written a couple of books. I've been at this for over a decade. Uh, the first one, the, the small one, is the, is the book that you can give to your manager and they'll actually understand it. They can read it on the train. Uh, the second one is about how do you actually design intranets so that they are usable. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, and actually the third one is coming out in hopefully two weeks. Assuming I can get the e-commerce working. So the new book which I've been working on all year is just about to go live. And this is about exploring what makes a brilliant intranet. So it's really what I'm covering in this talk, but more of. Anyway, it's got a very bright cover. That's the important thing. So let's get stuck into it. 
So what are intranets for? So let me, let me just do a bit of audience polling. So are uh, intranets primarily about content, documents, metadata, all of this stuff? Hands up, believers in this. Okay, one, okay, right. Well, maybe, maybe this will grab your fancy. So maybe the intranets are mostly about collaboration, about social, all of that sort of stuff. My sites, all of that kind of capability. Hands up. Well, okay, so some tentative half hands for a bunch of people. Maybe I haven't grabbed your interest yet. So, okay, so this is a .NET user group. So this should be a, a good one. So it's all about development. This is workflow, this is forms, this is applications, portals, all of that stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, great, great, but still a bunch of hands. So, so maybe it's because it's about all of those things. Yes, great, so now we get a few more hands. So I think that's both the, the, the challenge and the joy uh, of the intradets, which is that it brings together a vast amount of capabilities to deliver it out to staff. So how do we get some shape around this though? So for a while now we've talked about there being five fundamental purposes for intranets. So content, communication, collaboration, culture and activity. So I'm going to explore each of these in turn. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an awful lot of screenshots. <coughs> because that's one of the fundamental differences between websites and intranets. Designing websites is easy. How do you want to know what the leading edge websites look like when you visit them? How do you want to know what the best practice websites are? Then look at your favourite websites and look for patterns and make up your own mind. You want to get funding from senior management. Then you go off and find the organisation that they are most jealous of, that has a great looking website and you say, look how good their stuff is, we have to do as well. Great. You can't do any of those things for intranets. And this is the fundamental thing that has held back intranets over the last 10 years, is that they are hidden from view. So when you guys have, have developed intranets and you've been involved in these projects, so how do you, what, what best practices have you drawn on? How have you determined what you should or shouldn't be doing around intranets? Thoughts? At the back, great, you've got a microphone already, well done. I'd say mostly feedback from previous engagements and at looking at sort of the requests that you sustain over time from previous clients. So you draw on, on your own personal experience, which is fair enough, and obviously some folks have done a bunch of sites. Right? So you're starting to gain a bunch of experience. Some of you guys may have only done one or two. <coughs> Even then though, it's tricky because all you're often drawing upon is what people have asked you to build. So was it successful? Do staff like the sites? Are they able to use them? Do they use them? I mean, these are the hard things to determine. And so the pace of innovation within intranets is much, much slower because the ability to share knowledge between people, between organisations is inherently hard. So I guess that's a lot of what we've been doing in this space is not the techie stuff, but identifying what works and what doesn't and sharing it as widely as possible. So thus, in the talk, I'm going to show you a heap of screenshots from organisations all around the globe of all sorts of different types. Um, not every screenshot is going to be relevant to you. You may not think well, any of them or all of them are perfect. I will talk about what I think is good from each of them. Um, because this is a .NET and a SharePoint gathering, the vast majority of the screenshots I'm showing are SharePoint. I've gone through my huge collection, I have selected stuff and biased them towards SharePoint. Not everyone is SharePoint, I think there's about five screenshots that are not SharePoint. Uh, if you want to ask me detailed questions about .NET configuration and SharePoint development, don't. I don't have any answers for that. You can talk amongst yourselves at pizza afterwards. What we are going to talk about is what can you do, what should you be doing with SharePoint when delivering an intranet. And that's the SharePoint examples. And I think it's just polite. 
considering the gathering. So. Okay, so starting off, content. So this is a traditional role of intranets and we've done great at this. That is to say, intranets end up piling up a vast amount of content. Maybe it proves to be a little bit harder to actually keep it up to date to ensure people can find it. And I had a great experience actually in Switzerland some, some little while back, I'm not in Zurich but in Geneva. And so I was in Geneva and I was presenting about intranets and being in Geneva it was mostly UN folks uh, and they all said, oh actually she's from Nestle, they've got an intranet with four million pages. Four million pages, says I. And the lady from Nestle says, no, no, that's not right. And I say, oh look, sorry, you know, they just told me that, you know, your intranet had four million pages. No, 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 it doesn't have four million pages, it has three and a half million pages. I mean, complete success. I mean, aren't you jealous? Imagine if one day you could get, you know, your intranets, the intranets of your clients up to four million pages. Maybe not. Because maybe a lot of those four million pages are crap. So let's look at what good means from the basics. And the most basic is this. This is in fact not SharePoint. This is actually WordPress, but we won't speak of that again. Uh, it's a page with content on it. So, first impressions. Clean. Clean. Yep. What else? Good overview on the left hand side. Good overview. So, so it's the kind of page you would look at and go, oh yeah, yeah, that looks kind of good. Does that match your experience when you have gone in to look at sites that people have developed on SharePoint or other, or other things? Oh, there's some nodding, there's some shaking of heads. So, so maybe you look at this and go, yeah, actually, that looks like good content, we should do that. But actually, it's surprising how few intranets have any content to this standard. And so that, I guess, is the first point, which is, don't bother deploying all of this wonderful hardware and software and all these layers and this huge vast site if the, soft, if the content on it is largely rubbish. So we should probably start with that in terms of good. But, you know, hey, maybe that's not you guys, that, that's other folks. So let me show you some other things. Let me show you this. So this is a page, so for, for those who can't see it clearly, so it's a My Employment page. It has headings like my role, my performance objectives, development and training, career, workplace, pay, benefits, etc. And it has links like my personal details, setting my objectives, uh, induction, uh, absence and vac vacation, my expenses, childcare, uh, car, train, travel. Okay, first impressions on this. I like the headings actually. I Okay. Pretty good. There's a man who likes the headings. Yeah, okay. What else? Really dense. Really dense. So there's a lot of stuff on this page. There's a hell of a lot of links. Yep. What else? Search. Search? What about it? You could just search instead? Maybe. Yep. What else? What if there's more content and it's, where's the more? So what if there's more content? So maybe this is not everything. Yeah, okay. And then one at the back? Uh, the category. Yeah, what about them? The yeah. Yep. So I love this page. Now it's ugly. And that's because it's old. And actually I like that too. And we'll talk a bit about that in a second. So why do I like this page? So first off, it's a My Employment page. So to what we were talking about earlier, it's not a HR page a finance page, an IT page, this is, on this page in fact there are no business unit names at all. There are no names of systems. There are no acronyms. There is no jargon. So if I want to know how I book travel in this company, I don't need to know who actually does the travel, I just go and click on the thing labelled travel and I get the details that I want. 
So this is actually a page with these categories and links is a page that is actually perfectly designed for the user, not for the organisation. And this didn't come about by chance. Right, so they used a bunch of techniques which I'll talk about in a second, the usability testing, card sorting, stuff like that. And the person who did this, Richard Hare, uh, he tells a lovely story about this. So he talks about how when they were testing this, they got actual users, they put them down in front of a computer and said, look for X. Oh, okay, if I'm looking for that, well, um, I guess, uh, well, I guess I'll click on my employment, uh, I could click on that link at the bottom. Okay. So is that right? Do I just click on the link in the bottom? Yeah. So I just click there. Yeah. So isn't that not something I'm missing? No. Because it seems kind of obvious, right? I'll just click on that link. Yes. But there's not, you know, something else I should be doing? I mean, it seems pretty obvious. Yes. Because why are you testing this? I mean, you just click on that link. And people were actually genuinely surprised and initially a little bit confused because the internet was actually easy to use. And people said, but it's never been like this before. I mean, I've worked for five different organisations and no one's internet was this obvious. I mean, honestly, why are you bothering testing this? So that's kind of the litmus test, isn't it? That it should be so intuitive that people can simply find what they want. And so there's a bunch of work around that. And we're going to talk about those techniques. But ask me any questions you've got about this page or share your opinions. Question there. We'll hand the microphone forward if there is one floating around somewhere. How did how did they arrive at the categories? I mean, it's this sort of is this an information design rather than um, a person rather than an IT person, isn't it? This is a whole. Yeah. Look, the question is, how do you come to this, right? And there are techniques, right? They're covered in the book with dots. So I'll I'll talk about them in a second. Now, are they an information design thing versus an IT thing? Well, they could be. But frankly, the techniques are not that complicated. And I don't see any reason why IT folks wouldn't be able to do this as well as anyone else. Because I think this is one of our challenges, is that vast numbers of SharePoint intranets are delivered. And truth be told, for some reason, almost all intranets delivered on SharePoint have settled on the one basic navigation structure which is typically, along, you can correct me on this, something along the lines of about the organisation, business units, forms, documents, and then collaboration. Hmm. So that navigation sucks because actually it structures everything according to the org structure. And if you have to know who owns it before you can find it, you're doomed. What those structures don't have are pages like this. And I would argue that these pages are the most important pages on intranets. I mean, the home page, look, sure, it's got stuff on it, news and videos and links and things. Top level menu, menu often isn't that hard to take the first click. The question is, what happens then? So now I'm dropped into the HR page that uses that default SharePoint template that says, welcome to the HR section. We're so glad you found your way here and we hope that you'll find this information useful. And here's a picture of the director and a list of their most recently updated documents. And some random links in the left-hand navigation of Doom. So we haven't helped people much, have we? We've dumped them into the HR landing page and we've let them do whatever they like. So maybe actually designing these pages is the critical thing. And the idea about grouping links into categories, good categories, is powerful. Because long lists are evil, 
because long lists are effectively random in order. You can do them how you like, do them alphabetical if you want, but unless you know specifically what letter something starts with, then you have to start from the beginning and work your way down. So long lists are evil, groups of stuff are good. Right? And this is perfectly possible to do in SharePoint. This is not actually a SharePoint example, but SharePoint in little boxy design is perfectly designed for this. Do a lot of these pages. They're very effective. Hmm. Uh, James, Adam, you've got a question. Two questions. Um, that image isn't in your most recent book. Which book is it from? Uh, the, the image is from this book. I'm glad you asked, um, Adam. So okay. And um, is that being on a mega menu just as good? A mega menu is fine, but the problem with a mega menu is that if you fitted this many things, because as you said, maybe even this doesn't cover absolutely everything. If you fitted this arch on a mega menu, then the mega menu is the size of a page. At which point, what the hell are we achieving, right? I mean, it's not saving a click. You've got to click to open the menu, and then you've got to click the item. No, you can just hover. Yeah. So if I was to tell you this, that, that, that um, Jared Spool, a, a well-known usability expert, um, how many people know Jared Spool? <coughs> Excellent. Let me try a different question. How many people know Jacob Nielsen? Oh, excellent, a few. So he's got that ugly website. The ugly website, which he's changed, by the way. Oh, has he? <laughs> Unbelievable, 10 years later. Um, so Jared Spool is Jacob Nielsen's arch enemy. Oh, really? That's the best way of describing it. They're like superheroes. In fact, there is a comic strip about them. But anyway, his observation is that users don't move the mouse until they've worked out what they want to click on. Users don't move the mouse until they've worked out what they're going to click on. So what does that say about hover? I mean, have you observed people going, carefully hovering their way across all of the menus and things? No. So maybe this whole mega menu thing is cut off the wrong direction. Frankly, it's hard to do in SharePoint anyway, so let's not bother. And hovering is a pain on touch tablets. Well, yeah, look, and there's some small confusion about this, like the fancy SharePoint 2013 search, which is a thing of glorious beauty with all this incredible hover functionality. Wait a second, wasn't it all about tablets? H how do you do that on a tablet exactly? So hover and touch are mutually exclusive. So someone's got to make up their mind on that one. But anyway, look, if you really want to do mega menus, do, but frankly, don't. Do these instead. They're easier, they're much more straightforward to deliver, they're easier to manage and you can fit a lot more on it and it just works better for everyone. Why am I showing you, by the way, such an old screenshot that is kind of ugly? Because this screenshot is five years old. It's still the page they use today. Now, it's a big corporate. They will have restructured God only knows how many times in the last five years. A human resources is probably called people and human performance or something equally useful. So what? HR wasn't on this page in the first place. The same fundamental services are delivered. All of the business units are renamed. They all report to different people. I don't care. This page is as valid today as five years ago. So it is immune to restructures, or at least largely so. Yes, you have some thoughts on this. Does, yeah, grab the microphone, you want to pass the microphone back. I won't do all too much on any one screenshot, but I thought I'd give you a chance to be chatty at this point. Sure, I just wanted to raise an opinion on the mega, mega menus. Oh good, I'm being controversial, so please jump in. So, someone has decided they want to do something before they come to this page. They've decided they want to go to the My Employment page. So they've already clicked on my employment. They've already put their mouse on my employment. So poten the potential that the mega menu has is that at the time they go and put their mouse over mega menu, as they're about to click on it, it slides down and allows them to make a subsequent choice immediately without having to wait for the whole page to load. And it, you're sure. right, they might click immediately the first time, <coughs> even though they will see it slide down, they'll click through and land on this page. But the second time, they'll wait 
because users are smart, they learn. And the next menu they go to, if they want to go to about, I can't read from here, about us, for example, they might, next time they might pause a little bit longer and actually take advantage of the mega menu and save themselves some time. Yeah, look, sure. I mean, I, I, you can design a great intranet that has pages like this or has mega menus. Um, there's nothing about mega menus that is inherently evil. They do have some limitations. I think of it more like a landing, a landing page that's already right there immediately. So it's more like an alternative navigation, just like we also offer search as well for the people that like it. Sure. What I would say though, the, the critical thing is either way to have the right items. I mean, have the right top level menus, and we'll talk about that in a second, and have the right grouped items within either the mega menu or this page. And that's the critical success. Now I would say, right, I mean, if, if people would like mega menu, go off and do it. I mean, do make sure that it is easy to manage. Certainly in previous versions of SharePoint, mega menu was difficult where actually you end up having to do, you know, Visual Studio stuff to update the items in the menu, which is a bit of a mismatch with the fact that maybe the content owner should be able to update this without technical knowledge. So if you are going to do making menus in SharePoint, do them well. But hey, there are ways of doing that. It's easier in SharePoint 2013. But let's, let's look at this whole thing. So let's, let's look at the whole top menu thing, right, separate from mega menus or these landing pages. So let me get your opinions about this. So I'll read these out. I'm going to show you a bunch of different menus. I'm not seeking opinions about the graphic design, by the way, just whether you think the top level items are good. And we had a conversation about this. So OK, so this is the first one. This is Stockland. Uh, so home, workplace, HR, policies and forms, assets and development, advisory services and systems. Hands up if you think that's good. Oh, okay, it's not really, I was half up hand tentatively, but maybe, okay, that's, you don't like that one. That's fair enough. Can I have, make one comment about that? Yeah. My first comment would be, I would expect policies and forms to be under each section. Ah, maybe so. Rather than its own top level menu. Okay, so there is some, there is some concerns about the items. Great. Okay, so don't vote for that one. Maybe you'll vote for this one. So this is Dulux. So home, resource centre, work groups, people, safety and sustainability, our company. Who likes this one? Well, okay, well half a hand is better than nothing, but still not grabbing people's fancy. Okay, all right, well let's keep pushing on then. So what, what is resource centre? Oh, what is resource center? Let's talk about that in a second. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah, and there's a, there is a concept that underpins great navigation. It's called information sent. How many people know about information sent? Oh, okay, so information sent is about the idea that all I've shown you is what end users get, all right? Menus, pick the right one. All you've got to go on is the labelling of them. Now some items, I don't know, um, safety and sustainability may give you a lot of clues about what's in there. Obviously safety stuff. Right, so that's, that's described as having strong information scent, the strong smell of the information. Resource centre. Yeah, right to Adam's point. Well what's in there? Well, anything. Everything. Isn't everything a, a resource? It's the intranet, a resource centre. So this has got little to no information sent, and so Adam's right, there's a bad menu item. Just briefly, yeah. I just want to mention that I think looking at some of these, of course we can immediately as designers get an idea of the aesthetic, yeah. but when it comes to the information architecture, we know so little about these businesses. It could be that Every employee in Dulux knows exactly what those are because resource center is a well-known department in the company or something like that. And I think it's a little bit hard for us to judge, like we're often looking from a public site perspective because you're right, we're so experienced with public websites, being able to compare them. And those are ones where we don't know the companies, we have to understand everything instantly. 
But these are sites where someone is using this every day for their working lives. They get to know their own intranet pretty well. It doesn't, it doesn't, they don't have to make a thousand dollar sale on the first visit. So what you're saying is that maybe you don't feel qualified to answer this because, yeah. But I think an employee or someone who has to work there for a uh, while might find this quite easy. So that's an interesting point, isn't it? Right, so maybe I'm showing you a bunch of different options. I don't need to look at them and you could make some value judgment on them. But maybe every value judgment you made was wrong. Sure, yeah. right, because that's the point, right? Exactly what you're saying, which is the only thing that counts is that the actual staff in these actual organisations, when they actually go to look, stu look for stuff on the internet, can actually find it. There is no theoretical right navigation. There are some things that are generally better or worse. Resource centre is would generally be bad because it's got poor information sent, except, as you say, maybe the resource centre is a physical building with big signs and it's part of the 20 year history of the organisation, everyone just knows about it, and so for Dulux, it's perfect. And it, might, it might not be the best for the first day of an employee's employment, but give them a week, once they've clicked in there once before and they've had a look what's there, from then on it's probably fine. So, well, yes and no. So that's where we would disagree. Uh, because, yes, the intranets are different from websites. In fact, in almost all respects, websites, people are coming fresh to the site, not knowing anything about the organisation, so you kind of have to assume nothing and this may be their first and last visit, so they're not going to learn the navigation, so we need to be absolutely unambiguously clear. Intranets, people will use them over a one year or a ten year period, so they will certainly learn about them. That being said, time is short, interest is low, people are not living their lives on the intranet, so they're not going to go off and spend the first day browsing through every bit of the intranet to learn exactly what everything means. Right? We, um, in my firm, and I'm, uh, including me, I spend a lot of time with actual staff in actual organisations talking to them. And I can assure you that in most cases they can't find anything on the intranet. Now they will have found the five things they absolutely need to get frequently and there'll be muscle memory. I'll click here and here and that thing over there and there's that page. Ask them to find anything else, they're stuffed. So they will learn to a certain degree. But that's not enough. You still need intranets to be usable because typically people are going to the intranet for a different thing each time. Rarely they're going back for the same thing every day. So often they are exploring parts of the site they've never been to before. So. There isn't any absolute principles other than information sent to guide us in designing us. So how do we work this out? Do we make it up because they'll bugger it, they'll just learn? No, that is a bad strategy. So this is, however, where we use the standard user experience, or user-centered design techniques that we use for websites. Apply perfectly to intranets as well. So this is things like card sorting, People familiar with card sorting? Oh, it's a basic, it's an idea of, okay, what am I going to have as my menu items? So I'm going to take what's on the internet, I'm going to identify the groups of, of items, the clusters, and I'm going to write them on filing cards. So that's a stack of 100 cards. I get actual users, end users. I get them in around a nice round table, I throw out the cards onto the table and I say group these into piles that make sense to you. And when you have them grouped, could you please write me a label for each of the piles? And that's a great way of uncovering how people think about information. It doesn't magically come up with the navigation, but it gives you great insight and it helps us get from outside our own head and into the heads of others. This is probably the most widely used technique. It's, it's pretty good. There are some limitations. This is probably my favourite technique. It's a technique called tree testing. So this is a technique that you can do in bits of paper. So this is a mock 
menu structure. Again, done on filing cards. So at the top is the top level menu, and then there's the next card is a le level below. So you end up with a pile of cards, and again, you give people tasks. So you're looking for how to, how to apply for leave. Here's your menu, where would you look? Oh, okay, I'd look in menu three. Okay, this is menu three, where would you look now? And it's a great technique because it tests whether people can actually find stuff. You can do it on filing cards, which costs you about buck fifty worth of filing cards and about two days worth of time. There's also a fancy tool called TreeJack. So TreeJack, all one word, it comes out of New Zealand from a company called Optimal Usability. It is a super cool, very sexy tool for doing this online. It costs a hundred bucks a month or something, a couple of hundred, super cheap. And again, it allows you to test your navigation before you've deployed a single server for SharePoint, before you've created a single site collection or site, before a single menu or page has been created, you can test it. And it's cheap and it's quick and you can email out a link to the online tool, they go off and they do it. Within a week you've got 200 people testing it and then you know whether Resource Centre works or not because other people found stuff or they didn't. And it gives you pretty graphs. Then you can show to management and stuff like that. Great technique. Has anyone come across this before? You might have used similar things. We made up this naming so, um, and we've popularised it, but it's a great little technique. I mean the third and I guess the, 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 the most practical is usability testing, which I've talked about already. It's about getting actual users sitting in front of either the current site or the prototype of the new site or bits of paper for that matter and then you give them tasks and you watch them succeed or probably fail. And you observe where they fail and then you make changes so that they succeed. Again, it's a super practical technique. This technique, um, all of you guys should know because it applies to every interface that you deliver. So whether this is workflow solutions, whether this is websites, whether this is rich web applications, usability testing is critical. Uh, otherwise, that big red button that you are sure that everyone would click, but everyone ignored because they thought it was an ad, yes, that's not good. That's easy to fix if you know about it. Thoughts? Have anyone, has anyone had an experience with usability testing? Yes. You want to grab a microphone. But only as the developer with a whole sort of rack of um, experienced usability testers on the other end. With scenarios, sort of, you know, 50 pages and business rules and stuff like that. It's there is a whole industry of people around this, right? They call themselves various things, usability experts, information architects, UX people, whatever. They're very good at it. That's great. If, if the organisation can afford to employ them, then, then do that, yeah. Or you guys do it. Because actually every one of the techniques I've talked about is simple enough that you can just go off and do it yourself. Now you won't be as good as a usability expert. You won't have the 50 pages worth of script. But you will still test things and you'll find stuff. Uh, and you'll have done it as part of the project and so you won't have left it to one big chunk of testing which is never the right strategy. You've done little bits where you can and it'll make a difference. Some testing is infinitely better than none. And if you do it and you kind of crap initially, then you'll get better over time. There's no downside to learning on the job for all of these techniques. That is certainly the message that I'm putting out there. These are not techniques for experts. These are techniques that all of us can do and should do. Hmm. Okay. Let me show you some more cool stuff though. So all I've talked about so far is the basics. Right, is basic content on the side and how to structure it. So that's not very interesting, so let, let's, let's push the boundary a little and let's start to make SharePoint work a little harder. So let me talk about this example. So this is IMF, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and their uh, tool called All About a Country, in this case All About Argentina. 
The backstory is this. So you may be aware that the IMF provides funds to countries in trouble, particularly developing countries, to get themselves into a better state. The IMF, though, frankly, was not very well liked. Um, developed countries just didn't need them anymore, and developing countries hated their guts uh, because they were really demanding and difficult, and people didn't like dealing with them. So frankly, the IMF was quietly scaling itself down. They'd gone on, they'd, they'd downsized, they'd lost a third of their staff, the most experienced third, and they were looking at having a smaller role in the within the world. And then this thing called global financial crisis happened and suddenly now the IMF is at the centre of things. Suddenly now they're involved in bailouts of countries, countries like Greece, you know, first world countries in theory. So suddenly now they're terribly important. And actually before they could be very quiet. They were almost never in the news. They could take months to go through and make decisions and circulate reports. Suddenly now they're on the front page every second day and they're making decisions not in months, not in weeks, often in days. And their strategy before of having a bunch of experts who knew good stuff and so you would put the expert on this and they would take three months and sort the answer out didn't work for two reasons. One, most of the experts had left. And two, Things were shifting so fast that this idea that you could have everyone's knowledge in people's heads wasn't going to cut it. So, okay, what are you going to do about that? What's that got to do with the intranet? What's that got to do with SharePoint? So IMF had a vast amount of information at its disposal, but it was in separate databases. So separate sources that actually no one knew how to pull together. So what did they do? They used SharePoint to build an interface to pull everything into the one spot. So all about Argentina, at the top are their knowledge documents, they're their highly important internal reports, external information pulled in, Factiva feeds, here's the presentation of data from their databases and their data modelling, World Economic Outlook, bottom right hand corner, here are the key people, the country specialists, the people in the country at the moment. All of this was brought together using a taxonomy. And without creating a single piece of new content, this solution in SharePoint absolutely transformed how the entire organisation worked. And this is really content at its best. This is the internet doing what it should be doing, by adding value, by surfacing stuff, by linking it together and simplifying. It's a lovely project, we gave them a trophy for it. Hmm. Thoughts or questions about that? Uh, I wouldn't mind asking a technical question. Um, when you say it pulled in all this data from lots of databases, was that just using BTS? Oh, I have no idea. I do know that what it required was that all of the data sources were classifying stuff in the same way. So they went through a taxonomy project with experts and they did a lot of hard work around that behind the scenes. What was really nice is that the CEO of the time said, okay, We've instituted this project, we've delivered this solution. Anyone within a month who brings a report to my desk that has not been classified against the taxonomy will be fired on the spot. So, very powerful message. We're going to make this work. Now, as it happens, the CEO of the time was Dominic Strauss-Kahn. <laughs> Anyone who's read the news. So it turns out that a great man can be flawed in other respects. But anyway, great CEO. Ah, pity about his personal life. So, yeah. But there is a bunch of work behind the scenes to do this. And this again, I think, is, is again to a .NET audience. This is where we add value, is in the development that delivers these kinds of things. Right, this is a solution specific to IMF. Uh, but that's what makes it powerful. And there is integration to be done, right? and money and work to be done on that. This is another example, maybe even pushed a step further. So, um, just check, there's a question online possibly. Oh, anyway, we'll find out. Um, so this is Bennett Jones. This is a mid-sized, of course they're doing the work at night uh, when everyone else has gone home. Anyway. 
Um, this is Bennett Jones. They're a mid-sized Canadian law firm. So they went off um, and they developed a new intranet fully in SharePoint. So this is SharePoint 2010, I think. And where again they added value around the content is that this is their database of what they call precedents. So precedents are their standard <laughs> templates they use when writing legal advice. So you go and find what you've done before, you copy and paste from it and work from that. This is the critical set of documents for a law firm. And they've done a vast amount of work around this. So there's great metadata, faceted metadata that allows you to navigate down to exactly the document you need. There's related documents. You can add warnings and notes to this, which the end users can do. So for example, I could say, be aware Canadian uh, antitrust legislation has recently changed, so these documents might need to be reviewed in light of the current legislation. But then they went step beyond that. So there's nice stuff. You can add these documents to your collection of stuff and it shows you who else has done that. And that's critical because in a law firm everything is driven by reputation. If the senior partner is using it, then I'm going to use it. So it's actually dry, it's working on human drivers within a law firm. And the really neat thing is that these documents, and these are documents attached, have got a little hidden code in them that means that when someone downloads them, uses them to create a new document, publishes that back into SharePoint, into the collection, you can then use a find the children feature to find all of the documents that were derived from this source. Which in the law firm context says, are these things being used? What are they using them for? Are there changes we should make based on how they're being used? And so they spent a lot of money on this. Right, this was a massive development, it's done by Habanero um, up in Canada. Beautiful job, vast amount of money, which they've made back already. Because this is the intranet managing their core content, driving how the business works. Right, this is what you use content types for in SharePoint when you do them properly. Uh, this is where you get the full value. It's one of the features that I think is one of the most powerful things in SharePoint and yet is used very rarely and often in a really minor way. This is what you do with SharePoint capabilities. Questions, comments about this? Oh, don't, don't be shy. Sort of traumatised by my last glimpse of a SharePoint intranet somewhere where I worked, where everything was blue and underlined, and things were called project documents, yes. and you had to be sent the link to find the documents for the project yeah. that you were actually working on. So you know you spent half the day finding the document you were writing. So yeah. I like that because also the use of colour and mm. layout really makes it easier to to find, you're not having to sort things by date to work out what was the latest thing that was written. Yeah, that's right. And, and we're going to talk about that in culture to come, which is actually the design counts. Uh, and so we'll touch upon that. But let me, let me push on further, because I want a bunch more stuff. I'm only scratching the surface. I'm going to pick up the pace. Mobile. You should be doing that. Mobile, it's, it's quite big. You might have heard. So. Nothing we deliver within organisations should not work on mobile devices, either these or even that strange surface thing. So uh, this is critical. It must be considered as part of what we do, whether as a simple, what I call a mobile front door, or using responsive <coughs> web design, which is hideously hard in SharePoint 2010 or earlier, and is massively easier in SharePoint 2013, thank goodness. So then we can actually have one design that adapts depending on the device that's being used. Do that. Because actually, in a lot of cases, this will be more popular than the desktop interface. <clears throat> can I just make a comment about responsive design? Because I loved it initially and loved implementing it for clients. But then I personally get incredibly frustrated when I actually know a site and I can't get to the original site <coughs> I want and they've cut down my content. 
Yeah, look, it's the whole mobile space is evolving month to month. And, and what the best practice is now, there is vigorous debate about all of that. And there's responsive web design, there's adaptive web design, uh, which is particularly taking stuff away. Look, it's, it's a moving target. Um, we don't yet know what great solutions look like in this space. We know that we have to be doing stuff because actually, realistically, most people are not often at their desk. I um, mean, to Adam's point, he flew down from Brisbane today. In a couple of days, he'd be in Canberra. You know, I haven't seen him sit at his desk at all this afternoon. He's used a mobile device. This is the reality of how we work these days. So we have to deliver to these solutions. How best to do it? Well, I don't know. Watch this space. Uh, I can tell you best, best practice. Can you? Yeah, give me a link that's just give me the normal side yeah, of the yeah. bottom. Yeah, yeah, you should do that too, clearly. But jump in. One, one prime bad example I always uh, come across is LinkedIn because LinkedIn on a tablet always directs you to a touch interface yes. and well, loses the deep link. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just a pain. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, LinkedIn drives me crazy on the phone for that reason. I click on a link and then suddenly now I'm in this stupid interface and I just wanted to read the article. It, it's, yeah. it's not even that's the problem. It's, it's actually so most time for me that at least it loses the deep link. Yeah, so you right. end up on the top the page. Yeah, that's right. That should not happen. But Something. flip side, right? So I, uh, we did work in a very large media company in Australia that started with N, um, which I won't name. Uh, so they had an issue where the CEO message was sent out. It was sent out an email with a link to the internet. And then every time they did that, they got people emailing them saying, well, they're on their phone, but they can get their email and they click on the link and they can't get to the internet. Uh, so, flip side, you must have mobile enabled interfaces to some form. Because otherwise people are wondering why the link isn't working on the device that they're using at this time. And it's a huge problem for them. So, but watch this space. You'll be grateful that's the last noise you'll hear. Okay. <coughs> so, got a question? Yeah, please, jump. I just thought that was a... Uh, um Good time to hear your opinion on um, companies exposing their internet externally, because most of the time these people are receiving links via email. Yes. They're maybe on their own phones, or maybe they're on a company phone, but generally it's just connected to Telstra or Vodafone. They don't have any VPN through to the company internet. Um, a lot of companies don't seem to have an extranet facility where you can log in with some sort of forms login. So, you know, should we? How much are we doing that? Who does that? And is it one in ten companies? Is it? There's a big debate on the on the LinkedIn internet groups at the moment about that very topic, and there's been a bunch of blogging about it just in the last couple of weeks. Um, about should we be putting intranets visible externally for for the reasons you've outlined? Um, my argument would be this: though. it's an edge case. People, the few examples there are are places like universities, which frankly don't have a clear delineation between internal and external at the best of times. We're doing a bunch of university work at the moment, so it's really, they're, an unu they're a special case unlike anyone else. What I would say is, uh, make sure you can access the internet from outside. And I don't just mean from mobiles, I mean when people are at home, they should be able to log on to the internet. Because when I'm booking leave, maybe I need to be checking with my other boss about which dates I'm choosing. So actually, maybe I want to do a work thing when I'm at home. And there's a bunch of people working from home, you know, all this flexible working practices. So you need proper external access. And I mean just HTTPS with some basic log on, because it's not that complicated. Jeez, live in the modern age. Um, but beyond that, I'd say you do have to secure it, because if your intranet is so it contains only content you could expose externally, then it's not doing very much. I mean, it should be containing content and tools that need to be secured in some way. Now, make that security simple because I don't understand why it's complex. I mean, the whole two-factor authentication or using special apps, I mean, that's all rubbish. We don't need to do that the vast majority of cases. So I do say secure it, but then make that security as simple and as transparent as possible. 
That would be my thought. But anyway, let me push on. So let me talk about communication. I won't spend an awful lot of time on this. I think this is the simple one. So this is the idea about the intranet as a channel for internal news. Uh, hopefully replacing all the all staff emails, which are obviously evil. And so this looks a bunch of obvious things to say here. I think this is a good example of from a media organisation. This name starts with N. Um, and so I think it's a really strong example for a few reasons. So first off, it's your classic internet homepage that is mostly news. Now, that is not always a good thing. In this instance, though, it is. So this is an organisation that is going through an immense amount of change. So you might have heard newspaper business, kind of difficult now. So used to make heaps of money, doesn't now. Suddenly now they're restructuring and becoming a more corporate organisation for the first time. This is their first corporate intranet in the history of the organisation. What is this intranet talking about? It's actually talking about the change. Because the only thing people care about is what is happening within the organisation. So it's giving an awful lot of information about the change. And it's also celebrating what news is great at, which is the incredible imagery, the stories they're delivering. This intranet has already been replaced. Because they've moved beyond that as the organisation has continued to restructure. But at this point of time, this comms function is strategic for them. And when we look at it, so this, is a, this is another example from the IMF. I mean, this is the standard we should be delivering to. Right? News as you would see in an online newspaper. So videos, proper headlines, nice categories, good design, comments on news items. All of this stuff is frankly or should be standard on intranets. Sad truth is that SharePoint is absolutely terrible at news out of the box for reasons that totally mystify me and have been utterly not fixed in SharePoint 2013. So all you get is these terrible little links, list of links, and I would like a summary and a little picture and some dates and some layout, all of which I guess keeps all of you guys in business writing that as .NET, which is fine. But it definitely is worth delivering stuff to this level within organisations because this is what people need and this is what they expect based on what they see out in the wider world. There's not much more to say about it than that, I think. Questions? Comments? Yep, news. You know, we understand what good news looks like. We should be doing that. And then I think we can start to go a step beyond this. So this is another SharePoint intranet. This is one that we're recently involved in designing. So this is Asiano, which is a big freight company. So they run the ports in Sydney. They also have big trucking business. They have a train business, as you might expect from the picture. So they're a very operational organisation. They are spread across Australia. They have a bunch of people who are working in the port or driving trains or trucks or loading stuff. So it's very hands-on business. Corporate news, Asiano posts record profits or share price has gone up or CEO has done the CEO sleep out. Yeah, you need to communicate that because that's what the comms people like to communicate, but that's not the stuff that people need to know about. So what have they done? So they've used really basic but handy functionality in SharePoint to tailor news. So the news in the top left hand corner, for those of you who can't see it at the back, Terminals and Logistics Queensland. That is the Queensland news for the people in the terminals and logistic area of the organisation, top left corner of the homepage. Below that, are the group updates in brackets national. Likewise, the top right hand corner, there is Fisherman Island Toolbox. Fisherman Island uh, is one of their ports. And so that is the tools they need, the links to their safety documents, to their procedural stuff for their location. 
that SharePoint, of course, knows because it's pulled that information out of Active Directory and it has simply tailored the homepage to meet the needs of key groups of staff. If you're working in an organisation that is more than about 500 staff, you need to be doing this because staff are not all the same, the areas of the organisation are not all doing the same thing. So you, this is where again SharePoint adds a lot of value by allowing you to do this portal type capability in the home page but to deliver it in a lovely simple way like this. Do this, it's good. You can do fancier things than this but this would be the starting point I would, I would recommend. Thoughts or questions on that? <coughs> okay. This is, a, this is, I think, a really interesting one. This is the, if I go back a step, if I can convince it to, there we go. Um, this is the Coca-Cola Enterprises homepage. So this is Coca-Cola mostly in Europe, because right, there's multiple Coca-Colas, which I won't explain, it's kind of complicated. This is their homepage, which is unlike a homepage you've seen before. And it's interesting. It has a very clear purpose. It has three columns. First column is communication, the second column is collaboration, and the third column is transactions. And I'm going to show you different columns as I go through. So actually this homepage has a lot of structure and it's actually doing an awful lot of stuff. Which means therefore that on the comm side of things that they can feature local news at the top, again tailored, global news at the bottom, featured story with video, and still have plenty of real estate left over and I'll talk about how that works in a second. It's an interesting homepage on all sorts of different levels. It's done in SharePoint 2010 by the way. Um, it is multilingual across eight different languages I think because it operates all through Europe. I don't know whether it covers Switzerland but it does do a bunch of other places. Uh, and so there is actually a fully multilingual site delivered in SharePoint 2010 which involve quite a lot of work. Anyway, you can make it pretty, look. News to mobiles. You should do that too. And actually I would, I've asked the question, is the natural channel for internal communications actually the mobile rather than the internet? We know that people only go to the internet when they need something and then they need something. I mean, they're going to go off and find it. They're in a hurry. They get it. They close the internet. Getting people to read news items is quite hard. But actually delivering to mobile. So nowadays, we can't be bored even for a second. So before, we would have stood at the bus stop and stared at something, people walking past. But now, we're checking our email. We're playing Angry Birds or Farmville or whatever because it, it's utterly implausible that we would spend even an instant of time not occupied doing something. So maybe then if I'm sitting in the office and I'm sitting in the meeting room and I'm waiting for people to turn up, then maybe in that five minutes I'm so bored that I'd even read the news. And that's our opportunity to get corporate news <coughs> to staff. So maybe actually they can check the news when they're on the train on the way to work because they know they're going to go into back-to-back -back meetings all morning and they'll never have a chance to even sit at their desk, let alone fire up their PC. But in five minutes they can just quickly scan through the headlines just to see there isn't something they don't need to know about. That's, I think, the real opportunity. And so maybe comms is actually mostly going to be on mobile. But I don't know. That's more a question than an answer at this point. So let me talk about the hot topic, collaboration. It's cool. Microsoft is certainly very keen on it. They went off and bought Yammer, so they must think there's some value in this thing. So this is a hot topic for a lot of organisations. And certainly one of the areas, the SharePoint can do a bunch of stuff. But what does it mean and how do we ensure it's successful? That's, I think, what we're still learning. So let me talk about Stockland first. So this is a SharePoint 2010 intranet with NewsGator. We helped them design their first intranet, their 1.0 intranet. It was a classic content communication intranet. 
Um, they bedded that in, they got that working, they made sure people could find stuff on it. And then about a year later they said, okay, well that was a good start, but now we want to do more. We want a proper 2.0 intranet, you know, with collaboration being a key element. Where they were smart though was on two levels. Firstly, they said, yes, but what do we mean by collaboration? Let's try and work that out first. Because Stockland, well, they do a bunch of things. So they do housing developments. So is this about architects sharing best practices for delivering modern homes? Hmm, maybe. Is it about salespeople who are selling those homes to people? Is it about sharing leads for potential customers? Maybe. Well, they also run shopping centres. So is this about shopping centre managers sharing resources around solving common problems they're encountering within their centres? Well, it could be all of those things or none. Each of those needs, though, may be completely different and have a completely different set of tools. I mean, is this about real-time communication via link? Is this about um, document-based collaboration? Is this about more conversational things like Yammer and, and those sort of things? Is it about project-based collaboration? Well, they're four completely different things, all of which would be called collaboration. So for them, they said, well, actually what we identify there being a gap around is, is the conversational aspect of things. And so they establish solution for that. That's what they use NewsGator for. And they branded it. So this is called Stockland Circles. And that allowed them to say, this is what we're launching. This is what it's about. This is how you use it. They get group home pages. So this is the customer circle. So members, discussions, all of that stuff that you can do either in NewsGator or Yammer, or there's some capabilities obviously in 2013. And then they revisited the home page. And this is the other nice thing that they did, which was that they went through a proper design process for how they wanted their intranet to look once collaboration had been deployed. So this is the wireframes we helped them with. And this was their new homepage where, yes, there's some news across the top, but actually a lot of the homepage is now devoted to an activity stream because there's frankly no point in having people discussing stuff within little spaces if no one actually knows the discussions are happening. So you need to give visibility to that and that's why you put an activity stream on the home page. Now they had to spend an awful lot of space on the home page because NewsGator at the time had some limitations and stuff which they've all fixed now. But I think it's interesting that says if we're serious about collaboration so if you're in an organisation or you're working with a customer who says, right, collaboration is critical, we are deploying SharePoint to greatly enhance our collaboration within the organisation, then if that collaboration is not visible on the home page, then what the hell? Clearly you weren't that serious about it, that you'd actually allocate pixels on the home page to it. So I think it's an important thing. I mean, it, it serves a practical purpose, but it also sends a message which says, this stuff's important. You should use it because we've just devoted half of the screen real estate of the homepage to it. So clearly we think it's pretty important organisationally. And that's an interesting discussion and one that organisations are still wrestling with. Thoughts or questions about the collaboration thing? I'll show you a few more bits in a second. So let me show you something, oh, I'll show you something simple first. Um, this is a simple thing. This says, internet homepage, in a box there is a list of my team sites. Not some useless adds to favourites thing. SharePoint simply knows which team sites you're an active participant on and lists it on the homepage. You should do this. I've talked about this at various SharePoint groups and a number of people have said, oh, but it's terribly difficult in SharePoint to do this. Frankly, that's because there was a lack of structure around stuff. What they did was they ensured and they, they mandated that every team site has exactly three security groups, owners, contributors, readers. 
everyone must sit in one of those three groups. There can be no local exceptions. Therefore, if I want to know what to list on this page, then find me all team sites that I am either an owner or a con contributor to. It's simple. In SharePoint 2013, this is, awfully, this is obviously a lot easier, particularly with a search-driven navigation. So it's about saying, again, bringing together collaboration and traditional intranets into the one spot. Because if they're two separate interfaces, they are competing with each other and no one wins. This is a, an example of SharePoint being used to deliver what you would call a social intranet. This is from Oricon down in Melbourne in Australia. And so this is where social becomes a critical part of the site. So on the left is your classical news items. They do have commenting of, on them, of course. But then on the right, there's the conversations side of things surfaced up on the internet. With gamification, that terribly trendy term, used to engage people in the design of the internet. And, and um, they're quite proud of this, and they talk about delivering this intranet with no development. So this is delivered using out-of-the-box SharePoint. Now they are clearly doing some front-end development, so this is JavaScript and maybe TypeScript stuff, but there is no .NET development that's gone into this intranet. And that's kind of interesting, but that's something you guys can discuss amongst yourselves better than I can. This is probably the most radical SharePoint intranet in the world and possibly the most radical full stop. So this is from AMP, so the Australian Financial Services Firm. What would you say if I told you this is their homepage? Does this look like a homepage, internet homepage you've seen before? So where are the normal bits? Where's the news? Where are the quick links? Where's the weather or the latest Dilbert cartoon? Right, none of those things are here. So the home page of the intranet for them is their social feed, which is kind of radical for a financial services firm who are not typically seen as being that radical. So this is their home page. And again, this is really saying it's all about collaboration. So this is Again, SharePoint 2010, because they started slightly too early for 2013, unfortunately, and NewsGator, the latest version of it. This is then their news page. And so it is the buzz. They've actually got their navigation down the left-hand side with horizontal flyout menus, which, I don't know, time will tell whether that's a good idea or not, but it's interesting. And even in the news, there are social elements that are surfaced up in that. And then um, this is their tablet interface. So it's actually fully responsive across all of the devices. So again, on the tablet, they get the full functionality, you'll be glad to hear, but modified to appear on a tablet. So they've actually radically rethought the nature of intranets and they have actually put collaboration at the centre of it, fully using every single bit of functionality around collaboration that SharePoint and NewsGator collectively provide. <coughs> They're still learning how this is working, it's quite new, it was only launched a few months ago, but I think it's interesting really to push the boundaries of what this might look like. So there's a question online, is this a combination of Yammer and Outlook? No. No, it uses neither of those things. No, so it's SharePoint and NewsGator. I mean, obviously, Yammer and NewsGator are not dissimilar. They are obviously competitors in the space. No doubt each of them will talk about how they are better than the other. They have different capabilities. But no, it's interesting, isn't it? It says, well, maybe actually you're even blurring the lines between, between a web experience versus an experience in Outlook. And that's interesting. So as I, said, I don't know how this is going to fare, how this is going to evolve, but I commend them for exploring this kind of thing. And again, 
on mobile. So this is from Virgin America. This isn't SharePoint, but nonetheless. Um, so this is about saying that if social is about engaging people in collaboration, then maybe we should ensure that when they're wandering about with time to spare, they're able to do that. And again, the vendors are helping, but there will, for the foreseeable future, be a bunch of development around delivering interfaces that are great for this. The culture bit I'm going to touch upon, because you guys are all geeks. So if I was to say the internet is beautiful, maybe you don't care, you should. Um, let me ask you a, a simple question. If the internet is ugly, even if it's out of the box SharePoint with a whole page with underlined blue links, what message does that send? What does that say to staff? Shout some things out. We don't care. We don't care. Yeah, what else? We're not in control. We haven't thought about it. We opened the box, pressed the button, <laughs> and it made you use it. So yeah, we're not in control. We took the out of the box thing, and here, look, we're going to make you use it. Yeah, great. What else? What else does an ugly internet say? It also says we didn't, we didn't invest any money. We never thought about it. Yeah. Everybody's got it. That, that's been my impression on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we haven't put in any effort. We haven't invested any money in it. And frankly, if it looks out of the box, or particularly if it's old and ugly as well, then it says, don't trust it. Right? Clearly, we can't be bothered. Grab the microphone and down the front here, if someone's taking a break. So I know there's quite a debate about should SharePoint be beautiful. One example was in another big financial institute I worked for. Uh, someone, well, there, there was an internet, and I don't know what it was backed, uh, but then the IT side started to use SharePoint, and that was not controlled. And it, it was just popping up, and I, I bet there were like multiple instances of SharePoint popping up all over the shop. Uh, and it, no, no control, no nothing, and that's probably worse than, than just the file share where you put your Word documents. Yeah. Yeah. There's a word for that. MySpace. <laughs> There's a reason why he died, right? Because he was too ugly to live. Right? And that's not what we want internally. Now, I'm not saying that beautiful is the most important thing. Right? Make an intranet that is functional, make it useful, but also make it beautiful. Now your mileage will vary, you know, maybe you like the clean sort of Web 2.0 thing, if that's your style, you know, or Metro obviously, the not Metro. You know, maybe you like this, New Zealand, this is Kiwi Bank, blue and green, not the easiest colours to work with. This is SharePoint. All right. What have they done? They've put a banner. They've put some colour and they've put some shading around some of the boxes. Now, they haven't fought SharePoint. I mean, this is the most minor possible changes, and yes, it, yet it looks completely different. There's this intranet, which I've shown to people all around the world, and intranet <coughs> managers hate it. They say, it looks Teletubby. Is this an intranet for kids? But actually, it's, it's really quite successful. So Josh Patel, who's involved in developing this, um, he flags that this is actually based, this is Bupa Australia, they're a serious company, this is health insurance. This is based on one of their TV campaigns in the UK. But he says this, he says, even a year after the intranet was relaunched, people would come up to him in the morning and say, look, I just wanted to say, when I open up the intranet in the morning, it makes me smile. So that's not bad, right? So I mean, the internets that you've created or used, so what emotions do those generate? Maybe not joy. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do cartoon intranets, but I am saying maybe they should be kind of delightful in however you do them. And culture-wise, it's more than just look and feel. It's about reinforcing the identity of the organisation. 
This is from Canon Australia. The design is fairly simple. What do they have on the home page? They have an image of the week. Yeah. Right, so what? It's a picture on the home page. Waste of space. But okay, wait a second. So Yosemite National Park with El Capitan on the left and the half dome in the distance. EOS 550D with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. So this is photos taken by staff using Canon cameras. So what is this doing? So this is celebrating Canon equipment. So wait a second, Canon, the imaging company. So they're doing two things here. They're creating a more attractive, more engaging, more enjoyable intranet, but then they're reinforcing their own brand internally of look at the incredibly lovely things that you can create with your Canon camera. With one box. It's updated weekly. We'll go a step further. This is a SharePoint intranet from Ausgrid, what used to be Energy Australia. It split off to do the polls and distribution side of things. On their home page, which I think is reasonably attractive in its own right, your opinions will vary, they've got two boxes. Top right hand corner, network reliability. So when we say it's all about keeping the lights on, no, it really is about keeping the lights on. That's what they do. They deliver electricity. So that's the graph that shows how well they're doing. And then the bottom right hand corner, that's the safety side of things. They've got people up poles. So this says we think safety is so important. We will put it on the home page even though those numbers are not zero. And we will devote a significant portion of the home page to it because no really there are two things that are important, delivering electricity and keeping our staff safe. So again, that's kind of nice. A lot of this stuff, the bottom right stuff, is updated manually. It's not some fancy integration. It's a little bit where someone types it in once a month. The last bit which I really want to quickly look at is activity. Because this, is, I think, is the area where you guys can add the most value and where SharePoint can add the most value. So this is the internet as a place for doing things, not just for reading things. Right, now this is, this is simple stuff. Maybe it's online forms. And by online forms, I mean, you know, ones with a submit button. Not here is the useful forms page where there's a list of PDFs and Word documents where I can download the form fill it in by hand, send it across by internal mail where someone types it in and then rings the person when they've forgotten to fill in a field. This is obviously where your Nintexes and your K2s or even InfoPath is brilliant and we should be using an awful lot of it because it's infinitely better than doing stuff on paper or PDF which is the equivalent of it. It's also about doing little baby applications, right? Little simple info path things. This is a, instead of a legal request form or ringing the legal department, looking out of the box, here's a form. It drops it into a list. They have some basic approval. It's what, half a day to set up in SharePoint? And yet it makes this team's life massively better. So again, we should be doing hundreds or thousands of these within any, in any organisation. And this is often where we add the most value is in using SharePoint's um, transactional capability in local areas, not grand projects for the organisation as a whole. And I know a bunch of SharePoint implementers that are doing very nicely, thank you very much, steadily working their way from one side of a bank to another, quietly delivering these kinds of solutions. And I'd commend them for it. If we go back to the, the Coca-Cola example and to their transactional side of things on their third column, well this is kind of nice because it's probably too small to see from the back, but there's things like view my payslip that pops up in a light box on the home page, one click that gets you what you want. You can actually apply for leave from a light box on the home page of the intranet, integrated with SAP in the background. Good idea. So this is the internet actually being useful, not just ESS going to the home page of SAP 
good luck with that. Right, this is adding value. And it's not hard, right? It's a little bit of integration. Because then they said, well, why stop there? Right, then they've done this, which is very recent. They only launched this a few months ago. This is the same functionality available on the mobile. This is a mobile front end to SAP via SharePoint 2010. That's kind of neat. And what I think, what I love about it is this, is once people use it on the mobile, and it's really easy, because look, it's really easy, then actually start to say, so what, what, wait a second, why is everything on the desktop so hard then? So if you can give me an apply for leave form this simple, then what the hell happened to the Seresta SAP? Can someone please do something about this? Because you've now shown me that it's possible. And actually I wonder whether there's going to be a reverse takeover. Because you can't deliver crap to mobile. It doesn't fit. You've actually got to deliver something that's pretty reasonable. And once people see what good looks like, is there going to be a kind of an Arab spring for enterprise applications where they go, Oracle and SAP, let's tear it all down. <coughs> yeah, maybe not. But, but I think it does start to redefine expectations that maybe things don't have to be ridiculously hard within organisations. Because actually, modern developers using modern tools and, you know, APIs and SOAP and REST and all of this stuff, this is easy. Right? We're just really given the permission to go off and do it. And then we deliver this stuff. And this is the last example I'm going to show because I think this is one of the most impressive intranet examples I've seen in the globe and I think possibly the most impressive SharePoint deployment I've seen in the world. So it comes from Hanson Yunkin. So they're an Australian mid-sized building company. They build things. So buildings, bridges, roads, this kind of stuff. Their intranet homepage, which is not very interesting. So clearly I'm not showing you that. What, I, what am I showing you? I'm showing you this. So this is where they've used, I think it's Nintex, it could be K2, it's one of those two, to go through and to automate one of their core business processes directly using SharePoint. So, what is that core business process? It's called winning jobs. So they're based around Australia. They're primarily state-based. They had teams within each state who were bidding for and tendering for jobs. And they kept track of those jobs however they kept track of them. Um, sometimes well, sometimes not, but not all the same. As an organisation, they could not say this is all the jobs we're currently bidding on. They couldn't say what their pipeline of work was. They couldn't track whether they were consistently winning or losing jobs and which ones they were winning and losing. All of this changed by getting rid of all the Excel and getting rid of all the paper processes and all the Word documents, all of that totally wiped out across Australia by automating the entire business process. Quite a lot of work. Surprisingly, not actually all that much money because actually smart developers can do an immense amount of stuff quite quickly. So suddenly now everything is captured. And not just in a generic way, but exactly matching their organisation. And then once you suddenly start to do that, well this stuff gets dumped into a list, which you can then do things with. So here is a real-time list of all of the jobs we've bidded on or won. Uh, so they tell a great story and I, I hope I don't get in trouble for sharing it. So in Australia, a bunch of big building companies have recently gone bust. Bad time for building. And the banks approached Hanson Yunkin and said, so okay, you're not the biggest. Convince us that you're not going to go bust. And they went, well look, actually, let me show you. <coughs> and they were able to show their pipeline of work out for the next year or two with calculated figures for expected income at each stage of the pipeline and what their expected income was. And the banks went, oh yeah, that looks kind of good. Keep going. So they were actually able to 
um, deal with the banks, right? A critical organisation because they have data, actual data you can do stuff with. Uh, and then beyond that, hey, it's data with geospatial information. So suddenly now we can plot it on Google Earth. And uh, look, I could show you a heap of screenshots, which I'm not because I haven't got time. But you can drill down. Actually, I think of one example. You can drill down to an actual building project they're working on and here is the laid out plans and from this is linked all of the building information that's related to this. And they haven't stopped there, right? So that's winning jobs. They've also done the same process for starting jobs and they're working through every aspect of their business. And this is not some separate application. This is SharePoint. This is SharePoint with a workflow tool. And this is utterly transforming how they are working as an organisation and it is totally unique within Australia and as far as they're aware it's totally unique in the world and I tend to agree with them. Because this is where you guys add value. Because actually this is not that complex. Right? It's just an Intex or K2, whatever it is, with a bit of work with the right business to actually back it up so you're delivering the right kinds of things. And this is the intranet that is essential. And that's the title of my next book, Essential Intranets. Intranets that are critical to the core operation of the organisation. That are essential to the day-to-day -day work of staff. Not just, how do I find the leaf for? Not, what are the emergency details that the building happened to catch fire? But actually the stuff that makes the organisation more successful. Because this was the promise that IT made 10 years ago. 20 years ago. We're going to make everything more efficient. It clearly didn't happen. Now we can. Because now development is so much easier and the tools are so much better that all of this nasty rubbish we're still doing in Excel and Word and emailing about stuff, we can replace all of that with solutions like this. And this is transformative. And this is not a million dollar project because frankly, they're not that big. They run incredibly leanly, so this is actually quite a small project. Thoughts on this? Good, bad, typical, unusual? What do you reckon? Help me out here. It's going to be a very long time for the transition. A very long time for transition. Yeah, look, I asked them about that because, look, I didn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen people build all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is anyone using it? Well, they convinced me in a couple of ways. So firstly, they showed me this and I got to see the version that wasn't blurred out. And you can actually see at a glance that all of the things they're bidding on are in this system. But yeah, yeah. Okay. How hard was that? So I said, what did you have to do in terms of getting adoption? And they went, what do you mean? Well, you know, Big change, new system, people like their old ways of doing things, they love their Excel or their access or whatever. How did you prize it out of their cold, dead hands? I went, no, no, we didn't. Because, well, we worked with the five teams who do all the bids. And actually, they love it. And they started using it immediately because it does exactly what they need. And that's the interesting thing is that we talk about change management. But actually, I think by the way we go about projects, we create resistance to change, which we then have to undo. I've been in organisations where I've actually said that staff were right to resist the rollout of corporate IT systems because if people followed the new IT system, the organisation would cease to function because it simply wasn't fit for purpose. And so people simply worked around it and the organisation survived. All right. That's the bad side of things. But actually the flip side, when you get the right people in the room and they work together on the thing and it's better than what they did before, then actually they just use it. And it's, that sounds kind of flippant, but it isn't. Obviously there's a lot of design work and there's, they've got diagrams and all of this sort of stuff about the process they went through. But yeah, it's actually quite straightforward and you do it well. Uh, my comment before was more about the adoption in the companies or in the culture, not the actual yes. adoption of the new yes. uh, intranet. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Because mo most companies, at least, I, that I saw, 
don't really understand the importance. Yeah. Yeah, look, this was driven by the C CEO. So the, the person who, who's, who has done a lot of this work, well not developed, but the, the lead of the project, Michael Parks, um, sits down over lunch with the CEO and works closely with him about this. Because yeah, it's the business change that's the hard bit. Uh, and I guess my belief is that if we show people that this stuff is possible, that actually it's not that hard, that it doesn't cost millions of dollars, you can do it well, then hopefully we start to solve the problem about business not engaging in this stuff. Because it is a huge problem. Um, but, you know, look, it can be done. Uh, I'm ultimately optimistic, and I think it's for you guys to go off and to use things like Nintex or K2 or stuff like that, which are incredibly powerful tools. Find something small and do it beautifully. And then say, well, I could do some more of that. I want more of that. I'll have some more of that. And then do something else beautifully. And after you've done three or four things that work incredibly well, then you start to get to play the real game, where you start to get to do the proper projects that make big changes. That would be my thoughts. But anyway, I'm rambling. So, I've just given you a pile of screenshots and I've talked about a whole lot of stuff and it's now late at night. What does all this mean? So, first thing I would say is there is no one right answer for intranets. So, so what you can do is to use the five purposes as a kind of set of sliders. To have a discussion within the organisation about where the individual intranet should focus. Right? Maybe it should be all about content and comms in one organisation. And maybe everyone all sits on the same two floors of a building, so maybe collaboration is not relevant. Maybe the organisation is incredibly operational and everyone is out in the field. So maybe content's irrelevant because it's, in, it's not going to help them do their very operational stuff, so maybe it's all about activity. So it's about saying, find the right mix of stuff to match the organisation, both where it's at and where it wants to get to. And find your own level around this. And that's what I would say. So I want to say three things. So first off, find the right balance of functionality. SharePoint can do an awful lot of things. Now first off, the danger is that, well, you do a little bit of everything and it doesn't add up to much. It's very easy to get lost in SharePoint because it doesn't inherently point you in a direction. You could do all sorts of things. So you want to go into SharePoint with a clear understanding of what you want to get out of it. What is the outcome of it? But then also say, okay, out of all of this functionality, what are we going to turn on and what are we not? What are we going to start with and what are we going to come back to? And that's where you look at the five purposes and say, how are we going to get the right balance of functionality that will lead to success? Not too much functionality, not too little. Powerful but usable, that midpoint for the organisation you're in. I've also talked quite a lot about design because the best technology in the world is irrelevant if people can't actually use it. And yes, they will learn how to use it to a certain degree, but solutions within organisations should be as easy to use as what we experience on the wider web. In every aspect of what we're developing, not just the content and the navigation, but how we're designing the applications within SharePoint. And that's the crucial thing. And it doesn't need to be complex. The techniques are some things that everyone can use, at least to some degree. And finally, look, the obvious thing to say. It's not about the technology. I mean, it is about the technology. We're delivering, using it to deliver solutions. But those solutions only count for something if they deliver business value. And that, I think, is the real opportunity for SharePoint because it changes the nature of discussions within organisations. Where suddenly now there's a greater feature set and we can start to say, well, actually, what do we want to do with this? And maybe we want to do more than the intranet of old has done for us. And that's where we get a chance to say, well, actually, we could do these things. 
that will make more money, that will improve efficiency, that will reduce mistakes, that will improve customer satisfaction, whatever the objective is, intranets and you guys who deliver them can add vast business value. And that's where you always want the focus to be. So on that note, I'll, I will wrap up only to highlight um, that our site, step2.com.au, we have the single largest collection of free intranet articles in the world. We've published more stuff than everyone else added up, which is kind of odd. Um, but there's 300 articles covering anything you want to know. Lots and lots of good stuff. It's all there online. We publish two new articles every single month except January. Um, we're not, we've done it for 10 years now. We're not planning to stop any time in a hurry. We like writing stuff. Kind of like SSW, they like writing stuff too. So um, sign up to the monthly newsletter. We just use it to tell you when new articles come out. This is good stuff. You'll find value in it. And if you've got any questions, you're welcome to hunt me down now over pizza or chase me down afterwards. And I'm happy to provide a copy of the presentation or the video will obviously be up online shortly. And on that note, thank you. I've had fun. <laughs>